Hello darkness, my old friend. You've come to talk with me again. Sends lose 4-2 to the New York Islanders. I know I complained about it the other day, but can we have the shootout back now? At least the Sens got a point when they lost in the shootout. And can anybody answer me this? How come it is every time the Senators play some of their best hockey of the season, they always lose? Hopefully this is just part of the growing pains, and these kids need to learn how to win, and they're doing it now. As always though, let's kick things off with lineup changes. For the first time in a long time, lineup changes are easy. The same 18 skaters hit the ice for the third game in a row. The lone odd man out for the third game in a row is Christian Yaros, who continues to recover from an injury. The only change the sentence did make, after starting on Tuesday, Anderson was given the night off and Anders Nilsson got the start and goal. And in the early going, Brady Kachuk shows he's not afraid to mix it up hammers Brock Nelson into the boards, and pops the glass out. Thankfully no one was hurt, and after a short delay, we get back to hockey. Unfortunately, not long after we get back to hockey, the Islanders grab the lead. The Sens can't clear the puck, Letty keeps it into the point, he sends a shot on goal, Komarov stops it in front, he feeds Filpola, who skates around, throws a backhander on goal, it beats Nilsson, and it's 1-0 Islanders. You see this piece of vulcanized rubber? It's very simple. You do one thing with it. You get it, and you get it out. Done. End of story. No more goals. But no. Thankfully, it doesn't take the Sens long, and they respond with a goal of their own. Just over a minute after the Islanders grab the lead, Duclair is the puck in the Islanders' zone. He wheels around the zone carrying the puck for a bit, drops it for Harper. He throws a shot on goal. Kachuk gets a tip in front. He beats Grice, and it's 1-1. Nothing like a little hand-eye coordination to get the goal. What a nifty little tip. Something tells me we'll be seeing plenty more of that from the young Kachuk in the rest of his career. But then with just under five minutes left in the period, the Sens can't clear the puck again, and the Islanders get the lead again. Everly picks up a failed Sens clearing attempt. He throws it down low to Kunakel, who sends it in front to Philpola. He fires one by Nilsson, and it's 2-1. Thankfully, things don't get any worse, and we get to the end of the first period, with the Sens trailing 2-1. to one. Then the Sens come out in the second period, and absolutely dominate the Islanders, outshooting them 17-10, to 10, and outscoring chancing them 19-6. to 6. And after some early chances from both teams, including a terrific left pad stop by Nilsson on a 2-on-1 during a Sens power play, the Sens finally get the tie. Ryan throws a shot on goal, Grice makes the save, Lindbergh picks up the rebound, roofs it over Grice, and just like that, we're tied at two. You know, I've gotta say, I, like many people, wasn't happy to see Duchesne, Stone, and Dezingle gone, but we've gotta give Pierre Dorian some credit here. Yeah, the fact that he traded those three away isn't great, but if you look at it, look at what he got back. He got Gibbons back in a Pat Seeloff deal, then he got Duclair back in the Dezingle deal, and he got Lindbergh back in the Stone trade. Since those three have come over to Ottawa, Gibbons, Lindbergh, and Duclair have a combined six goals, as each of them have scored twice. You want to talk about sensing an opportunity and running with it? Those three have done exactly that. While not exactly guys I would expect to lead the team offensively, they've done that, and thankfully, they have been able to, because not many people have been scoring other than those three. Unfortunately, despite constant pressure, the Sens can't find another goal, and we head to the second intermission, tied at two. Unfortunately, that missed opportunity would prove costly, as the Islanders would grab the lead with less than seven minutes left in the third period. Pellick throws a shot on goal, Zach Smith knocks it down, and sends it to Anders Nilsson. Before he can get a glove on it, Beauvillier jams it in, and the Islanders lead 3-2. <sighs> That's just a bad break. Like, yeah, Smith could have done something else with the puck, but, I mean, how many times in the game do you see that exact thing happen? Goalie puts his glove on it, and the play is over. Unfortunately, in this case, Beauvillier put it in before that could happen, and the Sens are in a hole again. The Sens can't find the equalizer, and in the final minute, it's free goal time. Shabbat turns the puck over at the Islanders' blue line, Sizikis picks it up, Races back the other way, sends a backhander at the Sens blue line towards the Sens goal, hits the empty net, and the Islanders lead 4-2. Free goals! Thankfully, the Sens try to give away another free goal, which I really don't get. The Islanders don't take advantage and skate away with a 4-2 win. Let's just get into good news, bad news. 
The Sens were excellent in the face-off circle last night, winning nearly 60% of the draws, and that is the good news. The Islanders had five players who took face-offs last night, yet just one of them was 50% in the draw. Meanwhile, the Sens had six guys that took draws, and four of them were over 50%. In fact, three of them were over 60, and one of them was over 80. When you can win face-offs like that, it's a really big help for your team because it means that you get to control the puck. When you win the draw, you get possession and you have the advantage. Like the other day when I brought up giveaways, when the Sens are turning the puck over, they don't have it. But when they're winning the face-offs, they do have it. You have a better chance of scoring goals and a much better chance of dominating the play if you have the puck. That starts with face-offs, the Sens were really strong in the face-off dot last night, and that is the good news. Now, for the bad news. It seems like the better the Sens play, the less likely it is that they're going to win, and that is the bad news. You look at the game last night, Ottawa dominated a large part of it, including most of the second period, yet they found a way to lose. Twice in February I thought the Sens absolutely dominated the Red Wings, and both times they lost. In fact, one of those times, they were shot out. They played real well against Calgary two Sundays ago, and lost that one too. Like I mentioned at the beginning, hopefully this is just part of a young team learning how to win. The Leafs went through it in their first season with Matthews. In fact, they couldn't even hold a lead. Now you look at the Leafs, they're winning many games and holding many leads. If the Sens can continue on that same path, they should be there one day as well. As long as the young guys can learn how to win. Because right now, the better the Sens seem to play, the less likely it is that they're going to win, and that is the bad news. Next up, the Sens head back on the road for a Saturday night contest in Boston against the Bruins. The contest will be the fourth and final meeting of the season between the two teams. And as a Sens fan, thank goodness that's the case. So far this season, the Bruins have absolutely dominated the season series, winning all three games by a combined score of 12 to 5. And the Bruins' top line of Bergeron, Marchand, and Pasternak have absolutely dominated the Sens so far this season. Thankfully though, Pasternak has been dealing with an injury and isn't expected to be in the lineup. That should make things a little easier for the Sens, but they're still going to need to pay attention to Marchand and Bergeron. If they don't do that, those two will run roughshod over the Sens. If they do, they might have a chance to win. See you Saturday night.